Hello and welcome to Magala Foresight. This is Mikhail Manasse, producer and host of the show. Just recently, a group of researchers at Ghent University in Belgium published a recent uh, version of the Humanitarian Atlas of Tigray. With me today is one of these researchers, Professor Jan Niesen. He is uh, a professor at the Department of Geography at Ghent University in Belgium. He has been working there, instructing there since 2007, and his research mainly on Ethiopia uh, focuses on contributing to the identification and qualification of change in the coupled system of humans versus environment. Professor uh, Jan Niesen, welcome to Magala Foresight. Thank you for inviting me. So tell us what this uh, Atlas of Tigray is all about. It is not only an atlas of Tigray, it is an atlas of the humanitarian situation in Tigray. Uh, and it, we started it when the, we started seeing all the difficulties that the people in Tigray were facing, but also NGOs not having baseline information and or very scattered information, and we tried to bring it to, uh, together. And uh, we we, some first part of the atlas is baseline information. For instance, there is a confusion because the waradas have been restructured uh, in 2020 and uh, people were using old names, other people were using new names. So we published a map with the new waradas and the boundaries so that it's clear for everybody what we are talking about. We made maps of rainfall distribution, we made maps of cropping systems, because all this is important, of course, for those people who are going to aid uh, dry. And then, Depending on information that came in, gradually this it started started around February 2020, and about every month there is a new version that is published. And when new information becomes available, either we make new maps or we update the the current maps. So then the maps will be about food situation, where we take use secondary data, of course. The maps will be about massacres, unfortunately mainly based on primary data that we collect uh, uh, that we collect ourselves maps on accessibility that we take from secondary sources and we bring everything together and we publish it in, in one volume that is really accessible and can freely be distributed and cited by everybody okay so this latest uh, version uh, how is it different from the previous ones well, it, it is different from the from the previous in the sense that uh, we are getting updates about massacres, unfortunately. We are getting updates about uh, access to the areas and we try to follow. We try to follow that. So every month we publish a new map where. Massacres are maybe not increasing because mostly they are out, but <coughs> information becomes available and each time that we get new information, information we prepare a new a new map i must say i'm not the one who make this map we have we have a, a, a several younger younger uh, uh, geographers who are helping us to make to prepare these maps because you can imagine that there is a huge data set and a huge uh, uh, mapping uh, effort behind that i understand there are eight uh, researchers involved in this project right yes that's true even more now no even more if we take those who are informally in, involved and uh, but yes there are eight researchers and we are very lucky that uh, that we get some funding from an organization that is called every casualty counts that organization is you like the name says they are following civilian victims or even all victims of war all over the world and they try to coordinate the efforts that are done be it bosnia or syria or uh, Myanmar or any country on the world where where war is taking place and they found our atlas valuable enough to also provide us with some funding which allowed us then to, to have some intern students also to work with us and to uh, in the beginning it was purely let me say after hours that we were doing it uh, but now we have some intern students who are helping to do to do that. And then we have people who are more busy with data collection. Those who speak, uh, those who speak Tigrinya, yeah, especially when the telephone lines were open. You know, when the first massacres were coming out, when we started hearing these things ab about about uh, Aksum, you know, it first came like hearsay. People were traveling on foot from Aksum when they reached 
when they reached Michele, they transmitted to their relatives and others, and then it came, and then finally it came to us. Whoa, this cannot be true. It is so, it is so bad. And then gradually telephone lines were going, were opening, and we started telephoning everywhere. What we have always done when information from massacres comes is to cross-check and to and to verify if it is really if it is really true, because one, one can understand sometimes that people. One war that is totally forgotten, they may try to attract attention by developing a case. And from everything that we verified, I think there are three, four, uh, three, four massacres that we had to discard from from the 265 uh, that we have so far. Uh, and in one case, people were have been listing uh, had been listing some people who died already years ago, uh, just. To make aid come to their village, and then after telling polling, we say no. This this one, this massacre, we will discard. It. That's only one. And another one that we discard, that we discarded is the famous massacre that was announced by ISAT Television of 38 members of the interim administration who would have been killed in Puya. And then after telephoning here and there and reaching out to some members of the interim administration who are now refugee abroad. They told us no such thing has never happened. And one says, even I was the last the one to drive the last car of the interim ad administration, and nobody has been nobody has been shot in Puya by the by the uh, Tigray fighters when they were coming. So we discarded that massacre uh, also. So I, we have been doing all our best to verify that. But of course, there is much more. There is much more than what we have mapped. So often you, you hear, you read people, I was walking from uh, especially those who were running from, who were moving away from Western Tigray, they they saw lots of people, dead people along the road. Yeah, the, the person doesn't remember in which they crossed across villages that they have never been, so they don't remember. In, roughly, they remember an area, and there were 20 dead bodies in that place, but nobody could trace it. Like you know, it really to make the the effort of the of the victims. We should go to every warada and we should list, and that's only can be done only after the war. And we should list who is missing. Huh? Yeah, uh, so will, be, it will, will still be a huge effort for years huh, to know it all. In. Yeah. So you, there are well documented uh, over 250 massacres uh, in yeah. this uh, atlas, uh, yeah. and when, when you discarded just two uh, instances, two cases. And that shows that there was a very rigorous verification and research. Uh, there was, I must say, also people have been very careful in reporting because they have relatives who are living abroad or and you shouldn't report a fake news saying that our uncle has died if uncle is alive. Yeah, imagine the catastrophe for the whole family who is going to. So people are very are even conservative, are even restrictive in mentioning names of people who have been, uh, who have died. And the reality could be even even worse. Uh, that's but what I'm understanding. Much worse. We we yeah. were, for example, we were telephoning with people around uh, uh, Samre, uh, who told us, yes, in the mountains we found, we found dead people and we couldn't recognize them. They were probably on the move. From somewhere to somewhere, and we we buried. Yeah, we we saw from their the cross that they were having on their neck. We saw that they were Christians, and we buried them in the church as as unknown uh, as unknown uh, people. And there must be many all over. You know, the, another another bad thing thing that they were doing was almost hoping that the hyenas were coming. Yeah, very often they, for example, in in, in Mehabra they go. For, for months, they prevented the people to, you know, the, the, the young boys who were shot on the edge of the cliff. For months, they prevented people from collecting the, the remains, hoping that hyena eats everything and uh, there is no more, no more evidence. Huh? And, uh, and what, that's also what I hear from when I started communicating with, with Michele. My area is around uh, Hagere Silam, Madoga Tambian, and uh, one of my friends. They, they attacked his father. You know, the people went to the mountains to hide around Al Asa. After the battle was over, they came back, thinking that the Eritreans had left, but they were still present. And they were in his house, and they were slaughtering his oxen. And the dog had been with them to the mountains, 
And when they came, the dog run, runs to the soldiers. Huh? It's, it's, his, it's his job. The soldiers shoot the dog, and then they start kicking the old man with their gun, but he survived. He survived uh, finally. But other people in that village, they deliberately took them to gullies and to remote places and shot them over there in order to make them disappear. Let us say. But uh -huh. so, so, so much will be underrepresented in our atlas. But I think what we are showing is at least those places where it was happening. Very often it was related to battlefield losses, sometimes also for extracting uh, information. You know, the Eritreans, they came to they came to the village and they asked people, where is Debrecio? How oh, can this farmer know where is, where is Debrecio? They shoot the first one. Yeah, to, uh, and then hoping that the second will give information. But they don't know, uh, uh, people don't know where, didn't know, of course, where they could be, and probably they wouldn't have spoken anyway. But, um, you know, the area is around uh, Dogatemi and is, is known for many caves. And uh, they were having this idea, like in the 1980s, uh, Woyani was, was having their headquarters in a cave. So they were searching for caves. So that was, they were obnubilated by, by that. And if people so, didn't inform them, then they, and you know also that Dogatambian was, was the last headquarter before TPLF at that time occupied uh, Mekele. So they were still having that in their mind, cave in Dogatambian, they must be there. Yes, uh, Professor, uh, not only the enormity of the atrocities, but also the, the way it was conducted, the way it was, you know, inflicted. Can yeah, you describe the, some of the, the, hor the horrible, atrocities that happened and that you discovered in your research. Yeah, uh, but that is, that's of course more difficult to map. Yeah, well, but we yes. can, we can, because we bring it down to numbers and we bring it down to a map, but the, the, the horror in which, in which it, it happened, I explained a little bit with the, the father of my friend. I, I know that house very well. I have been invited to eat Basha and Maar so often in that place. It's a very, Doga Tembian is very famous for, for honey in better times. Yes. And, uh, but uh, the, that was in the beginning when the war started. That was before we may started making the Atlas. We have been warning after one week, eh, we, have, we have been warning this will be catastrophic because there is already COVID and the society is disorganized because uh, the locusts were, were there. Uh, and then you at war, so, and the, the society is always a bit semi-arid, so it's always difficult to, to survive in that play in such places, and all that will bring famine. But we didn't expect all the bad things that were going to the bad things that were going to happen. Uh, focusing on society, destructuring society, killing the priests in order to to disorient the people, giving mainly the message: they are even not afraid of killing the priests. They are even not afraid of killing in Aksum. So we should surrender. Uh, that's a bit the the way of, of handling all these. And, and saying Tigray never, never rise again. We are hammering you and you will be down for the rest for hundreds of years. And uh, mothers will be talking to their children about all the horror of 2020 to make them very afraid. Don't race again against uh, centralism of, of Ethiopia or something. Um, yeah, we can, we can tell so many bad stories of what, of what has happened. I must say that uh, I see Tigray TV going to many places that we mentioned in our atlas and taking witnesses where people tell very awful stories of uh, you know, so making people lie on the ground and then take a big stone and dump it on, on the head of the person. And I don't understand how people can do such uh, such things. Uh, from your research, uh, did you find out who the perpetrators were? I mean, not individually, but who are these actors who committed these yeah, atrocities? Uh, we, uh, I'm asking you this because uh, the UN uh, and the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission joint investigation report came up with this uh, both sidedism kind of report. Uh, they say they they accuse both sides for committing these atrocities. So what is the reality? Uh, now, now maybe first something that it is easy to accuse both sides. If you start a report with the idea, this report must be balanced. And we are going to find some war crimes by each of them. Yeah, they have started from that, from that 
such a report should start from the idea that this report should be truth yeah, and not it should be balanced and we are going to find some some war crimes by 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 each of them what we found uh, what we found and I'm, I'm a bit zooming on my on my numbers in 45 percent of the cases and I'm take about the fully documented civilian casualties 45 percent has been killed by Eritrean soldiers uh, 20 percent has been killed by Ethiopian soldiers 17 percent either Ethiopian or Eritrean because they were there together and when the people came back they found the dead so they cannot know who, who they did uh, four percent by Amhara and then we have 12 and a half percent that are not provided and very often that is related to Western Tigray because it was has always been so difficult to get information out of, of there and then a small one percent by uh, Tigray forces uh, that that is what we have in our uh, so, but then when it comes to this to this report, you know that or Atlas, we, I cannot say that I have been in contact with this with the with, with the investigation commission, but some people who were like their advisors, they have contacted me, and they ask it, can we give can we give your Atlas to the to this investigation this joint investigation team? I said, of course, it's there for that purpose. And then they they returned it, basically saying to to the person, uh, this is a bias report. We will, but at least they could have taken. We have we have the whole list of massacres. Yeah, they could have taken the place names and go there huh? and see and see if something happened or uh, uh, or not. Huh? Yeah, but okay, and, well, and, you know and, it also and, it, it went wrong yeah. from the beginning. Yeah. If you take a representative of one of the of the perpetrators in your team. Yeah, yeah, it will, it will go wrong. Huh? Yeah, and uh, it, it should be noted that the investigators did not go to some of these, uh, you know, uh, very, very the uh, places where cruel atrocities happened in like Mahabaradego, Aksum, yeah. Maram Dengelat and others. So they that went is, only to few places. That's obvious. Even they went to Bahardar because that's totally unrelated because a missile was shot to Bahardar. And the missile fell on the airport. It doesn't require an investigation for, for by a human right. This is military military stuff. Uh, we can agree or we can't agree. Cannot agree. That's another thing. But that's military stuff. It has, it has nothing to do about the human rights uh, investigation. Um, yeah. And then and then what is what is maybe and then maybe we should we can talk more about the Atlas also. But there's still one reflection about that, and that comes from the side of the Ethiopian government. Oh, but. We are not too much involved and we will sort it out. Yes, but their Eritrean friends, they are very strongly there. They were there on, inv on invitation of on invitation of Abiy Ahmed. Yeah? So he has given them, do what you want as long as you hammer these Tigrayans. That, that was a bit, the, 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 they, they got really a, <clears throat> a full power to do what they uh, what they wanted. So Abiy has to take responsibility also for, for what the Eritreans did. And now in recent times, yes, even it's even saying, oh, but these are our best friends and so on. Yeah, OK, then take responsibility for what they did. Uh, the, Daniel Bakala, the, who heads the Ethiopian Human Rights mm -hmm. Commission, uh, is quoted to have said that uh, it is comforting to know that uh, uh, the atrocities uh, or the, 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 the violations committed in Tigray uh, were not as they were feared, uh, you know, by the commission. What, what do you say to that? Yeah, if you don't want to find it, you will you will not find it. If if you have, you have some of these worst examples, <coughs> Habradego has been uh, has been filmed, has been geolocated very precisely. Yeah, even all evidence is is there. Not only people saying that or that bodies were there, but the actual killing is there. My Harmas. Uh, my Hermas, that's in Tabia Debra Abai. Uh, the, the same, the shoulders have been photographing the killing by themselves also. And then you are a commission and you don't go to such places. So they are not, they were trying to avoid such uh, such things. And then, of course, <coughs> they gave a lot of attention to my cadre. Nobody knows, I think, what has happened in my cadre. There are 
there are well nobody knows now we cannot say that many people will just did it they will they will know it uh depending on sources either it is amhara or it is tigray militia or it is both who have done it but they went there and of course in their report they will blame everything to the to the tigray side so of the 3055 that were you know documented uh, mm. deaths uh, by the 3rd of october 8% uh, uh, who were killed were women according yeah. to your finding 90% were men what does yeah. that indicate that's i have been interviewed quite sometimes by journalists about uh, about this figure are you not reporting fighters and that is then the question that comes from the from the journalist that yeah okay the, so many men it indicates that these these are not civilians these are fighters who have, have then been but no uh <coughs> several reasons there are men of 80 years old age zero yeah? and there are children uh so don't call all there are people the people who are killed and that have been identified by us they are in their own village they are father and son killed in the same house so you can't speak about can't speak about about fighters but they have been they have been targeting the men have been targeting the men but we don't we know also the bad things that they did to the women huh? yeah which is not reported in our atlas because it is, it is so difficult but they have been targeting the men because every man is like enemy of uh, yeah that, that, that so it's a it's a matter of of, of targeting indeed yeah so uh, the deaths because of uh, hunger uh, and disease was not well covered i i understand oh, by your it is, it is so, yeah it's not there huh? what we are having in this in this atlas is the victims of direct violence military by military yeah uh, the deaths by hunger by starvation by by disease we are following what what the humanitarian organizations are doing they have their standards for calculating you know they they will look at the if you take 100 babies and you look to the arm width of the the, the, the arm width of the babies you can know the share of, of babies that is underfed and you can know how you can by experience they can estimate how many of them will die yeah, that's so they are assessing it like that yeah and then you come with you come with out of 10,000 people two people are dying every day so the reported one percent deaths because of hunger yeah, and disease maybe is just it is just occasionally there if if people mention this person died by hunger we are not going to discard it from our data set yeah because you know in the end we should know everybody that's the idea of every casualty counts i know we cannot reach it but we aim to know everybody who died out of the war so we are not going to discard the one percent but this is totally this is totally underrepresented because the baby dies by diarrhea yeah and so people will not say he died by war they, there was diarrhea due to the war right? something and there was there was no hospital the baby died because there is no hospital uh, many people they are in also the the, the the tigray government doesn't know the statistics of people who die die by hunger because the communication system inside tigray is very slow there is no telephone also inside Tigray. There is no fixed line inside uh, inside Tigray. People have to communicate information, writing it on a piece of paper, waiting on a car that is coming, maybe giving it to, you know, like in probably when, when you were young and you um, giving it to the driver, please give this message in Michele to this person. And that And most of such information gets lost. Even, huh? And... Yeah. Um, uh, People so don't report. The regional government doesn't know it. The people who are on the brink of starving often they have don't have the energy to go to the town for getting cured. They know also that in the town there is not much. You go to the hospital, yeah, the, the hospital will say, yeah, we don't have any medicine. Send we, we send you back. Yeah, then it's better to wait in your village, yeah, rather than being sent back and having all this suffering on the. Uh, road. So uh, the identification and qualification of change 
in the coupled system of humans and the environment. That is your main area. Yeah. So sim simplify for us. Uh, how have the environment and humans been interacting in, in the last one year in Tigray? That is a that is a good a good question, and of course it relates to our earlier research. We came to this because all our friends in Tigray they have been telling us about massacres and about starvation, and we thought we have to report it. But of course, as a geographer, we are able to map it. But our research was about natural resources. Our research was about explosions. That means the slope was forbidden for grazing, and people were regrowing were regrowing a forest. Huh? Um, so uh, what is ha has been happening now with these natural with these natural resources? Maybe let me skip two aspects. And one aspect is about the natural vegetation and all the reforestation that the people have been doing. And we feared, we feared that if you don't have electricity, you have to cut, chop a tree, yeah, and you have to cut it, and then you use firewood. Yeah? So a lot of trees are, are disappearing. What is now recently new since the last months is there are organized groups of youngsters who do that as a business. Yeah, well, what they need income. The people in the town, they need a lot of. Can you imagine 500,000 people in um, in Mekele and they all need charcoal? So can so there is business for these people to 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 survive to sell it to uh, to sell it to make to Mekele. So lots of I cannot say the forest disappears. If if situation normalizes, mostly they will not ex excavate the roots. Yeah, so the trees will regrow, but it is a, a drawback, of course. We are now busy of uh, mapping that using satellite imagery. And with satellite imagery, especially you can recognize areas with tree cover. So, and we are going to verify the tree cover of this year to tree cover of last year at the same period. The rainfall has been more or less the same in the two years. So if we see a difference, we can allocate it to that increased pressure. The other big interaction of humans with the environment is agriculture. And people are using the environment to produce their, their food. And for we have been very afraid of that because there were numerous reports and stories of farmers being prevented from plowing. Even the, their, own, their own interim government was even saying this is a very bad thing that our farmers are being prevented from plowing. Farmers tried to find solutions by coming out in the night and plowing in the uh, in the night, be back at eight, nine in the morning before the soldiers were coming, not to be seen. Or if they were in remote places, they organized themselves. And one of them was uh, watch, was like a guard and watching. And if the soldiers are coming, everybody moves back to the village. In, and then, uh, but they could, of course, plow very little of their land in that way. And it was only after the Ethiopian and Eritrean troops were pushed out that people could start plowing. But we were late already at that time. Huh? The time for maize has gone. You know, maize is very important in a year like this, because if you can have maize, at this time you have a crop. And you can even row, you can eat it, and you can fill your stomach with it. But maize is sown in April or May. Yeah? So they couldn't do it mostly. Uh, sorghum is sown in April or May, couldn't be sown. And then sowing time, time came in end of June when they were moved out. Now we have to sow, but what are we going to sow? People have been sitting in the mountains very often. They took their grain, the wheat and the barley has become kolo. Yeah, and they eat it as kolo. They, their own seeds, they have eaten it. And then end of June, people were falling back. And for many things in agriculture, people have been falling back on the traditional system. Unfortunately, they know it. They still know it. And one of the things in, in traditional system is exchanging grains on the market. I have teff, but I need, I need wheat because my land is much better for wheat than for, than for teff. So they go in the market and they barter. One kilo of uh, teff grain for one and a half kilo of Wheat, it has its own exchange rates, it's not one by one, it depends on, on, the, on, the, on the market, let us say. So that's, that's what has happened then in Toruga on the market. This is not simply a market where people were going to buy Berbera and to buy coffee or, or, or 
something. This was a market where people were essentially exchanging grains. Every market in Tigray in that period were, were very busy with that, and they focused on such a market. Again, this aiming at, in my view, aiming at disrupting the agricultural system. What is even less, Togoga is my research area. I have been dozens of times in, in Togoga. There is another village that is called Adilal, which is a bit more to the to the north from Togoga, about 20 kilometers to the north. In Adilal, the same day there was market. They went to throw bombs on Adilal also, but the bombs have fallen outside of the market on the school compound, and there was nobody in the, in the school. So it has gone largely unnoticed because there were no victims. But they targeted a second market on the probably the same airplane. Huh? And the farming implements were also destroyed. That well, that is then farming. That depends on the locations. That depends on the locations. Not only the, the so they were not having grains. The farming implements were being uh, were being destroyed. Oxen have been eaten a lot. Donkeys have been donkeys have been stolen. Uh, and people are, yeah, with, with all that, missing a lot of, of implements for, for cropping. And we were really afraid that that was also the message that we got. Nothing has been sold. Yeah, that was what people were telling us. Then we stayed start, but let us still verify it. And then I was having contact with one uh, humanitarian worker who had been on the on a flight somewhere in May between uh, Michele and Addis, and he made photos from the airplane. And he told me, no, 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 not, you cannot say nothing has been plowed. Yeah, because he, here are the photos. So we, we have photos simply taken from the airplane, and you see here and there a land that has been plowed. So some people have been plowed. And then by end of, by end of June, beginning of May, everybody tried to plow, very often not for wheat, because, uh, the grain was eaten and they were late, but for teff, there has been a strong increase of sowing of teff because you can sow teff much later in the season up to end of July. You can sow uh, teff and teff cannot be eaten as follow. So they were still having their <coughs> having their teff uh, seeds. We can know this information because uh, we have been working since a long time with McKinley University and the colleagues from the Department of Geography of McKinley University. When the telephone line was open, we discussed the assignment. They went rounding seven Waredas around Mekele. Uh, and then through internet, uh, we found a connection and they send the report back to, to us. And so we have these, these data. And what we see is, like I was telling you, a lot more theft than normal, a lot more follow than normal. But many farmers, even if they have follow, they try to plow it, to scratch it at least, because it's like strategical thinking. The next year, the crop will be very good if you can plow your fallow in this uh, in this year. But in absence of seeds, of course, yeah, the, the only thing they could do was scratch the land and to follow it like like that. It has a name in Tigrinya, but I, I forgot it, this type of following. And then they've also been sowing a lot of oil crops. Tatie, yeah, Tatie especially flax. Uh, Oil crop will not give so much yield, but it's also considered as an improved way of following strategically thinking towards the next year. And then our team that was in the field, and I must say thank you to the command post of Michele because they received access to fuel to go to those areas to do that to do that survey. And uh, they were also ranking. They they observed 167 farmlands from summary up to. Um, uh, so uh, what what our team observed in the field on this 167 fields from Senkata up to Adigudom up to Samre, a bit that's a, and Hagraselam, that's a bit the radius that we could that we could study. Um, depending on the war it has, I asked them simply to talk with farmers. Is this land looking normal? Is this land looking promising? For this season of the year, is this a good crop stand? And uh, that you would expect in this area, and it depends on the waredas. In some waredas, it was 50% of the land that was having a normal crop stand. In some waredas, it was only 20% that was having a normal uh, crop stand. And uh, it means also that 
50% is having poor sound. Yeah, or eight, if you have 20% normal, that means 80% poor. Right? So we are with, and that's a bit the assessment that the crop yield by different uh, actors, that the crop yield in Tigray will, which they are harvesting right now, it will be like 25 up to 50% of a normal of a normal harvest. So with this blockade and uh, no humanitarian aid is going into Tigray, uh, you see, uh, and this uh, crop failure, uh, not many of the land is uh, tilled. So, what do you envisage uh, next year? What will happen? What will what what will happen? Can you can you imagine? I think everybody is afraid almost of getting reconnected. Huh? Yeah, everybody is afraid of seeing how will our friends, how will our relatives, how will they be after this? Now, what is it now? Four or five months of um, uh, of blockade and the war before that. And everything, huh? And now they will get a little bit of they will get a little bit of food from this from this harvest, uh, but it starts already. No grinding mill. Yeah, there is no electricity. There is no fuel. No grinding mill. So people will have to use these stones for uh, you know the grinding grinding their grain on on stones or simply eating kolo. Um, and in some areas, this stone mill, this grinding mill, uh, has been also destroyed by the. That's invaders. that's true, but I would say I would say that these are these probably that there is, has not been a systematic destruction of the grinding mills, but they they simply have no no, no yeah, so uh, they can't work anyway. Now, uh, uh, so. That not only that, it, now they are producing a little bit of food. I heard also from BBC that the Tigray forces in Kombolcha, they control now the World Food Program stores and that there is some food that is being transported to, to, to Tigray, to some extent with help from international organizations to, to distribute it, but it, it's also for a few weeks. Eh? So people have the blockade, if that is not lifted, all this is not going to going to alleviate a little bit, but the, the food that they produce is food for two, three months. Huh? And, uh, and 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 people are weak. Yeah? So many people have been killed or they have become soldiers, especially those who are who are the strong people for for doing the work on the on on the land. Huh? So for recover for recovery for resilience, there needs to be a very strong, very strong help. Huh? For years, huh? that's clear. Finally, what do we expect from the next humanitarian atlas of the Grai? What are you working on? Uh, what are we working on? We are updating. Good, nice question. We are updating the the data that we have about the massacres, about the about the food situation, of course. Uh, we are working on ter territorial control. Is al also been updated. We are making maps that link. Massacres with conflict incidents, and we can see, generally speaking, that there is a there is a, a connection. Very often, the massacres are in the place where there has been fights. Except in Western Tigray, especially Humera, there is no more fighting, but massacres continue. Yeah, that is a, that's also, uh, and we get still information not only from Humera but other places in Western Tigray where massacres still take place now. Eh? Um, and then uh, what we tended to see also is that the number of massacres by, and we are going to publish that, by May, June, you were having many fights because the Tigray forces became strong and relatively less massacres. And we can have, and while they were losing, normally when they were losing, they were taking revenge and so on. But it could well be that they were losing so fast that they only had time to run and no more time to go to the village and to kill to kill people. The other thing is also that they might some these soldiers might become aware that documenting is going on. You know, also that sometimes when a soldier gets killed, they look they look into his mobile and they find photos of yeah of, of massacres and so on. So they may also if they are feeling that they are going to lose the war, better to lose. The, to be a prisoner of war with, with clean hands. If you are a prisoner of war, yeah, with who has been killing and torturing people, that is not 
not pleasant for the prisoner of war right, to be in that situation. So they may have been afraid also of being captured after doing uh, war crimes. Uh, so that's another map about linking these uh, linking these uh, victims and massacres with uh, a war situation. And then a totally new map is going to come, and that's about the gold of Tigray. It has been cited a bit recently that um, would, the, would the war be for gold? Uh, people have been raising that, raising that suggestion. Uh, so we have been digging into reports. We have found that huge areas of Tigray has been, have been given as concession, mainly for exploration to Canadian societies. We are mapping these concessions. They are especially in northwestern Tigray and in the northern part of, or in most even, most of central Tigray also. Um, they, are con they are concessions for exploration, eh? not yet concessions for exploitation. So we, we, don't, we don't think that the war started because of gold. Already because in the mind of, let me say, Arad Kilo, Tigray is barren. There is nothing. Yeah? They don't see Tigray as a land with value. Eh? They see Tigray as, as parasites or something like, like that. Uh, but, the, but for Canada, because most of this gold exploration are Canadian uh, companies, for Canada, securing all these contracts for exploration is very, is very important. That is probably what explains among, I would say, if you take the, well, I wouldn't say that the industrialized countries or the Western countries, you have France a little bit on the side of Abi, you have Italy on the side of Abi, and then you have Canada on the side of Abi, uh, most probably because they want to secure their, their access to gold. Some analysts to whom I talk, they, they tell me within the next weeks, you will see Canada switching once they see that, that Abi is really losing the war. Uh, and if they still want to, if they was still want to secure their access to the gold in, in Tigray and then their rights of prospection, they will have to they will have to talk with the Tigrayan uh, authorities. Uh, but anyway, we are mapping that gold so that we found it in different maps in very poor quality maps. So we are making a nice map of the gold fields. That will then be an addition in our next version of the. Thank you. Looking forward to that. Uh, thank you, Professor, for giving us this very elaborate, uh, you know, reflections. Yes. It was my pleasure, and I take the opportunity, if ever this is broadcast in Tigray, to greet all my friends in Hagar Salam and Mekele. Yeah, sure, it will be. Thank you. <laughs>